everybody to the latest installment of the Juan Gold Show. Today, we are very lucky to have a large panel of some of your favorite founders and leaders of Bitcoin businesses that have been in establishment for years and months and some just brand new. So yes, excited to hear the viewpoints of these business leaders and help the audience figure out what it takes to get a Bitcoin business started. But as we warm up the room, I'd like to just go over some of the latest events from today. And so what do we have? First off the docket, it looks like Hong Kong based financial services company Venture Smart Financial Holdings is to launch a spot Bitcoin ETF within the first quarter of 2024. They're aiming for $500 million dollars in assets under management by the end of the year. So, I mean, this is very interesting that America goes ahead and approves the spot Bitcoin ETFs and then uh, China follows suit not too long after. So this seems like the global race to accumulate Bitcoin is only just getting started with uh, if we open up Asia to this uh, spot Bitcoin ETF game. I mean, who knows? I mean, today we're seeing tens of thousands of Bitcoin being uh, hoovered up just within the last week of trading of these spot Bitcoin ETFs in America. So if you add in Asia trading, um, wow, double, triple, quadruple that and uh, number must go up in order to accommodate all these people around the world hungrily going after Bitcoin. Uh, in other Bitcoin ETF news, uh, another morning, another 10,000 plus Bitcoin sent from Grayscale to Coinbase. Uh, this seems like a daily occurrence now, right before the 930 markets open. Grayscale is just unloading as many people are trying to get out of their preposterous 1.5% fee compared to the 20 to 30 basis points that a lot of the other ETFs are are offering. Um, in terms of ARC, we have Kathy Wood over here saying, Bitcoin is backed by the largest computer network in the world, a network orders of magnitude larger than the combined size of the clouds that Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have built over the last 15 to 20 years. Yes, at over 500 exahash a second, the Bitcoin network is orders of magnitude larger than any other computer network in the world and thus stronger, providing more security for your hard earned money. Uh, speaking of networks and digital payments, we've got Trump coming out yesterday saying that the CBDC will never be allowed to happen if he is to be elected president. He said such a currency would give the federal government, our federal government, absolute control over your money. They could take your money and you wouldn't even know it was gone. Um, interesting point there by the Donalds, uh, a man who was very vocally against Bitcoin in the past, um, but now that he seems to have Vivek Ramaswamy in his ear, this is the first thing that he said at a uh, on the campaign trail with uh, Vivek as his uh, his side man. Interesting. Um, and then further, ETF news doesn't stop. We've got the new uh, total for BlackRock here. They, as of yesterday, hold a total of $1.198 billion worth of Bitcoin. Um, I mean, to think that this is just after one week is pretty astonishing. Um, will they surpass uh, MicroStrategy in, uh, in two months from now? Who knows? We will shall see. Um, we've got a mining conference going down in Nashville right now. Uh, you can see lots of videos of people heating hot tubs with S19 Pros. You can see uh, upstream data's black boxes outside of businesses in downtown Nashville, mining Bitcoin silently on the streets of downtown. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. This seems like a very high signal event and um, definitely interested to hear the news that comes out of Nashville. And then one other piece of content here, we've got Bitcoin Shooter. He just released a mini documentary about the power of Bitcoin mining in rural Kenya and how Bitcoin mining allows um, grids and electrical companies to go into rural areas and utilize things such as hydropower um, and has instantaneous demand um, for that power from the Bitcoin miners, thus providing energy and electricity to these people who have had uh, very spotty electricity up until this point and completely changing their 
daily life. It's a pretty powerful four minute video. Highly recommend you go pick that, uh, check that out from Bitcoin Shooter. Juan, how are you doing today? Good, good. How are you guys doing? Very good. Yes, we've got a lot of people here from many different Bitcoin businesses. Very excited to hear their personal stories, how they got started, how they got into Bitcoin, uh, what led them to take the plunge into starting a business. Uh, has it gotten more competitive over the years? How they find working with other Bitcoiners and uh, just the tips and tricks of the trade. So, yes, I think this will be a very informative, educational show and uh, excited for it. Yeah, same. And I think, um, you know, I think business and entrepreneurship in Bitcoin is kind of a, a very special niche you know like there's a lot of stuff that's the same but there's some stuff that's kind of different and you know messaging and positioning and long-term thinking and investing you know there's a lot of questions here that i think a lot of people might be interested in you know and and as an entrepreneur as, as a sort of you know amateur entrepreneur i find them very interesting so definitely looking forward to it um i think we'll uh give a little shout out to our sponsor and then do a a, a round of uh, introductions because we have a very very uh a cool set of uh guest today and i think uh, we have a lot of things to talk about um now you know one of the things about bitcoin that's interesting is you know there's a lot of people that just hold it right and they just stack it but some people like to spend it right and um you know the the best way to spend bitcoin over the past like five years if you're like somebody that wants to live on bitcoin is actually uh spirit refill right they refill is one of the, the most uh active companies in the space they've innovated big time on the lightning network don't know if they were one of the first to integrate it and uh you can buy gift cards there they've say uh, they've saved me when i'm traveling to conferences so many times you just go and buy a um a sim card with them or refill your data locally or get an e-sim um and you just pay with bitcoin they don't ask any questions you don't even have to give them your email um i i did, I did groceries with a uh, refill once and say like 10 percent because there's like arbitrage opportunities in the in the in in, in their uh gift card sometimes so bitterfield is a super cool place to spend your bitcoin if you want to spend it sometimes you've got to spend a little bit of bitcoin bitterfield is an excellent way to do that without having to sell and pay commissions uh to get your cash right so it's a very interesting option um you can also get a uh, visa and mastercard uh prepaid card with them now in the united states and europe which is also very interesting so yeah if you go to bitcoin sorry to bitterfield and put the code bitcoin news you'll get you'll even get 10 percent cash back in bitcoin for your first purchase so uh we're very grateful for bitterfield sponsorship of the show it helps make it possible and um yeah let's uh let's get into this i mean we have we have a very we have quite a crew um let's start with uh with uh, Rhino, um, Rhino app, we've got a couple of people from Rhino, uh, Johnson and Hector. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. How are you doing, Juan? I'm good. I'm good. Good to good to talk to you again. You too. I think we met up in uh, yeah, El Salvador, right? Bitcoin. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So uh, let's let's start with you guys, uh, and then we'll go through the the other. Um, CEOs, entrepreneurs, give us a little bit like quick overview of, 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 of Rhino and the Rhino app. Yeah, so uh, we are, uh, so Rhino is a Bitcoin financial services company, and our goal is to give uh, uh, both existing and new Bitcoiners a way to, uh, to, to buy and sell Bitcoin and also ways to use their Bitcoin, such as, you know, spending it, like you mentioned just now, uh, saving it, getting it into cold storage, uh, using the Lightning Network, um, and just uh, as, I don't know how, everybody else on the call or you know, on the, uh, on the space, their experience was, but you know, mine was that uh, I, you know, when I got into Bitcoin, you, you start buying it at one place and then when you want to spend it, you go somewhere else. And then when you want to store it, you go somewhere else and you have to develop all these different relationships on different platforms with different companies. And so our vision was to try to give folks uh, a, a way to do that easily in one place. And um, that's what we're looking to do. And we're, uh, we're just getting started and looking forward to seeing the feedback that we get from the community as they start interacting with our, uh, with our platform and our app. That's, uh, that's very cool. It's very interesting. Yeah, I have to, I have to play with the Rhino app. I haven't uh, had a chance to really play with it yet. Um, Weiser, we got Weiser on the, on the panel as well. I'm not sure who's behind the mic, but uh, please uh, uh, 
tell us uh tell us what you guys are up to yeah hey guys thanks for having me on uh so i'm sanchan i'm one of the co-founders at wiser um it's connected with a bunch of you before so it's it's nice to nice to connect again but wiser is basically a gamified bitcoin and financial literacy app um we launched earlier in 2023 uh we've been live for about eight months now um and yeah our goal is just to to get to hyper bitcoinization through education right because uh I mean, we're still so early in the space and, and we just want to teach people in bite-sized classes. We uh, do it through a gamified learning journey. So people actually earn real Bitcoin rewards along their, um, along their learning journey. And, and we make it fun. It's, it's competitive and, and people can interact with each other. And yeah, we've grown into to a big community now. And uh, we're, we're really excited about this year and just a lot more content that's going to be coming up into the app. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Wiser. I think they've, they've really applied gamification to Bitcoin education and it's a, it's a very, uh, very powerful uh, combination. So it's very cool. Um, all right. And um, I believe we have the, the Relay app, uh, the Relay crew here. Um, just a second. Yep. Is that an emo? Okay, okay, I'm all. That's hey, 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 hi. Yes, it's Emo. We also have Julian here as well, and I believe maybe Adam as well. Uh, the two co-founders. Yeah, we are That's based in uh, we are based in Switzerland, but we serve the European market. We are non-custodial Bitcoin app, uh, and we allow everybody to basically buy Bitcoin and and hold their own Bitcoin. Um, and happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Okay, great. And uh, what what uh, what regions do you guys focus in? So we are we are originally from Switzerland, but we focus on the European market. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, awesome to have you guys. I've been hearing a lot about you uh, in the in the Relay app, so it's great to have you. And then also we have Nico from Simply Bitcoin. Uh, what's up, Nico? How are you doing, man? What's up, man? Happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, shout out, Hector. And uh, can you give us a quick uh, overview of Simply Bitcoin? Yeah, so I started Simply Bitcoin in 2020. Uh, we are focusing mostly on video. It's a daily live show that we do on YouTube, uh, and we also drop uh, original content as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, we're just trying to grow our YouTube presence. Very, very happy with the results. Uh, currently, one of the most watched daily pop, one of the most watched daily live shows, Bitcoin only on YouTube. We're very, very proud of that. Um, you guys know the deal. You guys make Bitcoin content as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to just make uh, Bitcoin content, get to talk about Bitcoin every day. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I love the conversations that we get to have in this industry. It's, uh, it's just fascinating, uh, space. It's never boring, right? It's always, there's always fantastic people, uh, doing crazy stuff. Um, all right. I think that's, I think that's everybody on the stage right now. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. Oh wait, there's also Daniel. Uh, Daniel, how are you doing? Hey, Juan. Uh, doing great. Uh, thanks for thanks for the invite. And like Nico, I'll give a shout out to Hector as well. I uh, love what they're building at Rhino. Excited to play around with it. Um, just a little a little bit of background on me. I've been a full time entrepreneur for five years. So I've batted about five hundred. Uh, half have been profitable. Half have not. Uh, and yeah, the last business I ran was a real estate business, and then I discovered Bitcoin and decided it was much better. Uh, so I've I've been working about the last year uh, laying the groundwork for a nonprofit called Bitcoin is Better, and our mission is to reintroduce the working class to Bitcoin uh, by helping them ask better questions about money. Uh, so excited to be here, and hopefully I can I can add some value to the conversation. Awesome. So yeah, the, the topic of the day is the Bitcoin business world. And, and so I guess I wanted to ask you guys just off the bat, like, you know, what the biggest challenge that you guys face as a Bitcoin business that's like, you know, Bitcoin specific, um, you know, what that, that, that issue is. And, um, yeah, maybe we can start, um, I mean, let's go in the order that I that I introduce you guys. Um, so maybe we can start with Rhino and go go with Wiser and, and go from there. You guys feel free to talk. By the way, like this is going to be the idea here is just let's just have a conversation about the world of Bitcoin business. It doesn't have to be super strict. I just wanted to get like an overview, sort of introduction, everybody. But uh, yeah, let's just talk about what it takes to make it in this in, in this 
in this niche, which is, you know, very special. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah. So, you know, for us, I imagine it's probably going to be a little bit different for, for each of us. Uh, one of the things that we have run into, into the development process is something that I think more broadly as a community, uh, we've all been reading about, which is, you know, the, the challenges around uh, getting infrastructure and specifically banking partners in order to be able to, uh, to bring uh, U.S. dollars uh, onto, onto and off of platform so that we can help people turn uh, their dirty fiat into, uh, into the best asset in the world uh, in Bitcoin. So, you know, what a lot of folks wrote about last year as Operation Choke Point 2.0, uh, we certainly dealt with a little bit of that in terms of banking partners deciding, hey, maybe we don't want to have Bitcoin businesses, you know, involved and, and facilitate your, uh, your use cases. So we had to navigate those waters uh, in order to be able to get to the point where we are now. So, that's probably the biggest challenge that we faced over the last, you know, handful of months as we've worked toward launch. Yeah, yeah, the banking is always it's always been an issue, um, and you know, I, I think that's what we got to go to consumer, right? Like, be able to buy things directly if we can if we can avoid do you know having to go to the fiat. But uh, yeah, banking's always been an issue. Um, Why, sir? How about you guys? What's what's the biggest challenge on your end? Yeah, so I think for us, um, with Education App, we're trying to teach people why Bitcoin, right? But when we approach so many people, we've realized that no one has been taught financial literacy correctly in school. So we're really trying to teach them through the lens. We're trying to teach financial literacy through the lens of Bitcoin, but people don't even understand that like the US dollar has lost 96% of its value, right? People don't People don't realize that fiat currency is so broken and our economic system is so broken and people think that bitcoin is just um the way it's portrayed in media the way the way these myths have been created is that bitcoin is just another uh asset that's going to just go up and then fly back down so i think we're trying to educate people we have like 500 free classes but we still the biggest challenge we find is trying to create that personalized customized journey right like people who are completely new to Bitcoin, they don't, they don't, they still don't understand why Bitcoin and the biggest challenge is trying to get that person in um, without just marketing Bitcoin so, so heavily. And I think <coughs> for the people who are, who are, yeah, the people who are already in it, like it's, we're still so early and it's still such a small community. So the, the, the hardest part is just trying to accelerate the, the, the hyper Bitcoinization journey. That's, that's really, yeah, that's really what it is. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The financial literacy issue is incredible. Like they don't teach most of the things that I know about finance and business. I've had to learn basically on my own, uh, on the internet, right? Like they don't teach it at school. They don't, they don't teach any accounting at school or like, you know, what is money or money management or risk management, like all these things that are like super important. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's the issue for most people, even like economics. We, we've, we've never really studied Austrian economics, right? We've never mm -hmm. studied taxes or how to invest. And I think, I think all of this is more than Bitcoin. It's just financial literacy. That's been taught the wrong way. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's that, that, that's a very interesting problem to tackle. I love, I love the world of financial literacy. I'll um, throw a little shout out to wiser there, by the way, you know, I, I discovered the app last year, right around the time of the Miami Bitcoin conference. And, dove right in and I, I really think they've done an amazing job with how they how they sort of distill down some of these difficult concepts around you know economics and money and that sort of thing into really digestible little chunks i think they really have a just a great way that they present the information uh that is particularly going to be useful for new coiners as they're just trying to take their first steps into understanding some of these concepts it's a great tool uh, you know, we're all always orange pilling people wherever. It's a terrific tool as a first leave behind, if you will. Uh, after having a brief conversation with somebody, just get them into Wiser, let let them start earning a few sats, learning a couple of things, and uh, they do a great job. It's a great tool. Thanks, Hector, and and we definitely got some help from you. So <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a great app. Are you guys uh, in languages other than English uh, yet? Not yet. We we will launch um, later this year, probably in Spanish, French. Just working on it. But yeah, we we definitely want right. to be global and be able to include everyone uh, into the app. So languages is a top priority. 
yeah, education is such an important piece of it because it has to do a lot with messaging as well. Like, how do you communicate to people? And if they don't even have, like, basic, you know, understandings of, of what money is and, you know, what's good money or bad money, it's, it's, exactly. it's pretty difficult to communicate with people. Um, all right. Um, big challenges. Let's uh, follow up with Nico. Yeah, I mean, so... You know, from the Bitcoin media space, I've uh, been doing this for quite a while, since 2020. Um, I led the YouTube team at Swan Bitcoin in 2023. So, like, one of the, um, you know, one of the things that I've realized really in, in the Bitcoin media sphere is just breaking out of the Bitcoin echo chamber. Uh, a lot of people don't realize is you're just making content for other Bitcoiners. Um, like the hard part really is getting outside of that echo chamber. And I think um, the Bitcoin Magazine crew does an incredible job at doing that, uh, you know, by inviting Vivek Ramaswamy, RFK Jr. to the Bitcoin conference. But that's really how we bridge the gap, right? And that's one of the most difficult things to do, right, is how do we continue to uh, grow this movement um, and how do we get the attention of people that are not aware of what's going on. And I think that's one of the biggest hurdles. Uh, I think number go up technology is, is a really big help there. Um, but it's, we can't just rely on number go up technology. People are interested, people get attracted, people come in, and then uh, hopefully there's enough content for different personalities to kind of serve their needs and really wake them up to what's going on. I think a lot of people are really divided right now by the political atmosphere. And as content creators, it's really our job to convince them, like, hey, guys, it's not left versus right. It's not red versus blue. It's really the party of green, the party of central bank digital currencies, fiat, slavery, nihilism versus the party of orange, Bitcoin, opportunity, prosperity, right? So as content creators, as someone who, you know, founded and started a media business from scratch with his bare hands, again, worked at Swan for about a year, uh, that's really our biggest hurdle right now is breaking that Bitcoin echo chamber. I think we're chipping at it slowly but surely. Uh, yesterday was a historic moment. You had Javier Malay, uh, you know, at the World Economic Forum talking about individualism versus collectivism. And, of course, you had Donald Trump. Uh, he didn't quite say Bitcoin, but you could tell that Vivek definitely whispered something in his ear uh, talking about how if he were to be elected president, uh, you know, he would be staunchly against central bank digital currency. So we're definitely making a lot of progress, but there's still a lot to work. There's still a lot of work to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking out of the Bitcoin uh, media bubble is tough. Definitely, definitely a, a challenge. Um, I've, I've, I'm very comfortable within the, the Bitcoin bubble. I'm just uh, talking to Bitcoiners. <laughs> but no, yeah, I think I think it's important to to find ways to reach to reach outside of it because uh, that's where everybody is, and most people are there. Um, Julian, uh, how about how about you guys? Where what's the biggest challenge with the the Relay app? Hello, everyone. Really uh, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so there's uh, oof, where do I begin? There's a lot of challenges <laughs> in an early stage uh, startup uh, when you're also in early stage industry, right? Where uh, an, a technology and an asset is is not even two decades old and it's just finding its way to the world. Um, there's a lot of things that that are still going wrong, and uh, that's why we have all these startups, right, in this industry that are building towards a better future, towards uh, mass adoption, etc. Which uh, I think we we won't see yet for for a couple of years uh, still. I think that's what we in our uh, bubble kind of. Uh, overestimate but still it's good that we are also uh, already working on that so i think the main um uh, issues we see is that uh, to, to make uh, things user friendly right um so bitcoin is a complex topic uh, not a lot of people uh, understand it so wizard and other uh, education media comes etc obviously helps but um it's it's really hard for for people to understand and it's hard for people uh, to use therefore for example a concrete example is the the, the on-chain fee 
a problem that we have now, like many people are buying a lot of small um, purchases, for example, at, at Relay, then they amass UTXOs because they don't understand how all this works. How should they, right? They are newcomers. Um, and then they want to send out and it costs them 10 or 15 bucks to send out, uh, you know, 50 bucks. And they're like, oh, this shit doesn't work. Um, and so we need to make these things smoother and more user-friendly both. I think there's a lot of things to do on uh, the chain level, like Bitcoin core level, uh, then on you know second and third layers and all the software, like protocol level, software level, and then the company level, like the front end, as we as we have built it at Relay, uh, to smoothen these these things out. Yes, to first educate people, but then also to make it just uh, so user friendly that uh, people don't need to know what UTXOs are. They don't need to care about on chain fees, etc. This needs to be all needs to be much smoother and work. Um, like PayPal or e-banking or credit cards or whatever they're used to. Otherwise, we will never reach um, uh, mass adoption, right? And then another problem is, I think, what which uh, a lot of uh, companies have, and I think um, we are doing a good job there, and, and also Swan, for example, and others, in, in trying to do a great marketing. And maybe Emo can add to that uh, later how we do it. Um, but a lot of companies in the space, uh, in the Bitcoin space, are kind of very tech oriented, but not um, business and marketing oriented. So they don't really care whether their product is really used by a lot of people. They just care about building cool technology. And I think what's really missing also to get mass adoption to, as an industry to be um, uh, respected as well, uh, and, and to keep growing uh, sustainably is that we build businesses that last, that grow, that market and sell their services well, and that reach uh, profitability. So all the things like you know marketing, sales, legal compliance, um, finances, etc., is also very important. I think uh, still neglected um, at this point in the industry. But maybe Imo can add to that a little bit as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, that, that's what I wanted to actually add to follow up is that one of the things that is a real challenge. I mean, we can talk about how to do marketing as a startup later if, if that's a topic of the discussion. But in terms of challenges and marketing, um, it's quite difficult, especially in Europe. Uh, I'm sure in the US it's probably similar as well. Um, you can't really do marketing uh, everywhere. It's a very fragmented market. So we need to get a license in every single country in Europe and then basically do marketing that way. Um, we we are now working on a European license, and then we will be able to allow sort of uh, markets across the continent. But it's it's really challenging. And then you also have the platforms; not all of them accept um, crypto businesses and Bitcoin businesses. So, for example, we are uh, licensed in uh, Switzerland. We are allowed to run marketing in Switzerland, but Google doesn't uh, actually run uh, Google Ads in Switzerland. Um, and challenges like this. So if you really want to use the best marketing channels, uh, the best paid marketing channels, you're quite limited and there's a lot of hurdles to go through, lots of paperwork to prove. Um, that is quite a challenge for, for startups that are sort of out of the really early stage and are ready to grow. Um, then you will need to get quite creative in sort of how to, how to achieve the next level in your growth. Yeah, that's that's actually something I think people are to some degree unaware of is how much, how, how many limitations there are in terms of advertising Bitcoin uh, apps. You know, Facebook, I believe, doesn't let you do any advertising uh, for Bitcoin or crypto related things. In part because there's been so many scams in the crypto world that, you know, they just, you know, uh, I think associate us with it. And they're just like, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, you, I'm not sure you can even advertise just straight Bitcoin education. I don't know if why you guys have had any any luck with. Oh, did we lose? Yeah, we lose Sanjay. Um, hey, but yeah, I'm like, here. I'm here. You're here. Okay, good. Yeah, have you guys had any experience um, advertising uh, the app on Instagram, for example? Yeah, so we haven't really faced any issues because we don't. We're not technically like a crypto or Bitcoin app or an educational right. app, right? So we don't fall under that category, but. Um, we also haven't done too much advertising, whatever we've gotten is quite organic. Uh, but it's, it's just, you have to just be careful with obviously the words you choose and, and, um, 
make sure that your visuals don't have the the crypto and bitcoin words so it is a little yeah. that is a little frustrating i hope that's going to change in the near future um but yeah we're more we're more educational and financial literacy so it's it's been okay for us right yeah yeah so it's you know you got to you got to go jump through some hoops um yeah yeah that's huge that means we got to get really creative with the with the marketing yeah um John just uh, joined. What's up, John? How are you doing? Uh, John from Mi Primero Bitcoin, my first Bitcoin. Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about Mi Primero Bitcoin for people that haven't uh, haven't heard about it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for having me up here on stage um, with all these other great projects. Uh, yeah, so Mi Primero Bitcoin is a Bitcoin education nonprofit. We like to say that El Salvador is the focus, the mission is the world. So we started here in El Salvador in 2021, the same month that the law went into effect, so September of 2021. And since then, we have taught over 30,000 students in person here in El Salvador. In addition to that, our, our kind of flagship product, the Bitcoin Diploma, which is a 10-week program, uh, we, we've taught that in the public school system ourselves, and we're actually working with the government here with the Ministry of Education um, starting in March we're going to train 700 public school teachers which will disperse around the country to teach that in their own schools then eventually probably in probably in two years uh, we expect it to be in every school in the country which is great um, because it's open source it's also been used by many other people around the world it's been translated into 12 languages currently the next version will come out in a couple of weeks and we expect that to be translated into many more languages because we've we've learned a little bit <laughs> we've learned a little bit and we've tried to create a version of it with an infrastructure on github and all that that should make it easier for people to to take and copy and modify um so yeah we also have a, a node network where we work with Bitcoin educators around the world who agree to a core set of principles independent that the education should be independent impartial community led Bitcoin only quality and teach empowerment and so long as you agree with that then then we want to work with you uh, we try to share resources best practices um, so we currently there are 28 nodes in 22 countries so and that's a project that is less than a year old that initiative so we're mm -hmm. We're really excited for 2024. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm a huge fan of of Mi Primero Bitcoin. Um, I think you guys you guys are putting in building infrastructure that's going to be that's really useful for education. Uh, what what is the biggest challenges you guys have faced? Um, you know, getting this far. Um, yeah. So even though we're a nonprofit, there's there's probably a lot of challenges that are the same whether non-profit or for-profit and and that's that's money right even though we're not trying to make money on this we still have operating costs uh so because we started at the end of 2021 a lot of our growth was actually in in a bear market um so in order to uh, you know we we had to learn how to become very efficient with all the all the sats that we had um I, I think that's going to get easier as, as we have proof of work that we could demonstrate. It gets a little bit easier to get grants and donors and all that. Um, and, and, you know, people are more optimistic now about the price of Bitcoin, which means that they're more generous. Um, but yeah, so that that's one challenge. Another challenge which has become clear over time is just the right team, right? It's just like everybody needs to be rowing in the same direction. And we have, I'm happy to say that like every iteration of the team, every new person that we add and, and it seems to, <laughs> seems to be trending in the right direction. Um, and I'm so happy with, with the team, the current team. And I think that I'll be even happier with the team in six months and a year. Um, so yeah, funding and the right people. So money and the right people to execute on that money. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, Daniel, um, what's the biggest challenge you faced as a Bitcoin entrepreneur? Yeah, thanks for the question, Juan. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, I've, I've been a dot-com guy 
for five years as an entrepreneur. So uh, learning the requirements of becoming a, you know, dot org 501c3 nonprofit uh, and the paperwork and the requirements that go with that um, has definitely challenged me personally. Um, and, and I would say, I mean, like was previously mentioned, it's about surrounding yourself with a good team. And I've been at this for about a year now, um, really defining the problem that we're addressing with this nonprofit uh, to make sure that it's worth the effort. And, and as I've, as I've gone along, um, I've been able to, to bring a, a solid team on board. We've, we've got our board up to 10 people now, uh, which is really great. So that, that vision for the nonprofit has been refined um, along with the people coming on board uh, because the biggest, the biggest hurdle is like, I always tell people, if you can't get a few people on board with your business idea, you shouldn't do it. Um, and with Bitcoin especially, it's like, is it possible to create curiosity that creates a desire for education? And I mean, there is some pushback to that. Like, would billboards, radio ads, commercials, is that going to do anything for mainstream adoption? And just listening to, you know, Emo, Emo and uh, Julian speak about the challenges of, of marketing a, uh, a, an exchange business and the regulations that come about that. Uh, that's, that's one area that our nonprofit wants to jump into and, and help out Bitcoin businesses. Um, as a nonprofit, we want to go out and create that curiosity uh, that then drives uh, pre-coiners to an education marketplace where Bitcoin businesses compete to educate their future customers. Um, because I, I think, I mean, after everything we lived through with FTX and BlockFi and Celsius, I doubt that Bitcoin companies are going to want to put their names on arenas, uh, are going to want to put their names on the umpire patches. I, I just think that marketing for Bitcoin is going to change after the pain of 2021. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, I would say the biggest challenge is learning how to uh, follow the rules and, and uh, establish the nonprofit, which we're hoping to do by quarter one. Um, to have everything filed and our, our bank account set up and ready to, ready to go. And then two is just defining the problem clearly and and then getting people on board with the mission. Awesome. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, the marketing problem is fascinating. I think that's a that's a topic we should probably get back to and like try to dig into a little bit further, but you know, I just wanted to kind of get a, a lay of the land, you know, I think that that definitely has painted a picture. Um, but maybe for people that are, that are, you know, thinking about getting into Bitcoin business or, or like they're really big fans of Bitcoin and they want to do something in this space. I just kind of want to ask an open question and maybe, maybe we can try a different, a different way of, of, of engaging it. And the question is, you know, why Bitcoin, you know, like there's some, there's so many other things that we could be doing. There's so many other ways to, in some cases, make even more money, especially with the talent that, that is just in this room alone, right? So, um, you know, the question is, why did you guys choose to come to the Bitcoin world? Why work on Bitcoin? Um, and as far as, like, the order in which to, to, to engage the question, I mean, feel free to, like, maybe raise your hand uh, and I'll throw it in. Or if anybody wants, you know, wants to lead the charge, um, yeah, maybe let's 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 see. Okay, the first person to give me an emoji was Julian. There you go. So Julian, why Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love this question because I mean I, I I'm a person or I was a person that reflects a lot on like why am I doing things, why I'm deciding this to do this and that, and I try to you know reflect and think really about my uh, life decisions as well. Especially when I was younger in my studies, I was really looking for something that. Um, is not only making me money and I hate to get up every morning, but really something that fulfills me and, you know, has a purpose and I wanted to drive positive change uh, and have a 
good impact in uh, the world, etc. And, you know, that's maybe a little bit my psychology bachelor's that speaking out of me, but <laughs> this is something that is close to my heart, and that's why I love this question. And so Bitcoin, for me, and I think for a lot of people, uh, is encompassing this uh, concept of ikigai. I don't know who uh, knows about this or not. You can Google it. There's a great uh, illustration about it, and it's really the ikigai is a is a is a Japanese um, method for a, a purposeful life, or is like a, a a great concept. And the ikigai basically is uh, the overlapping um, of four different uh, topics. So one, the first topic is what do you love. What do you like doing, you know? Second is, what is uh, something that the world needs? Uh, third is, uh, what is something that you can also make money from? And then fourth is, what, what are you good at? What, where do you excel? And if you find something uh, that you love doing, uh, the world needs it, you can make money from it, and you're really good at, that's the ikigai. Right. That's that's where that's exactly where you want to be in your job, because then you get up every morning before your alarm clock, you know, you're energized and you try to give it everything like 12 hours a day going the extra mile. And you at 100 percent, you will be successful as long as you don't give up, <laughs> as long as you don't give up and you work within your ikigai, you cannot be unsuccessful and bitcoin is this ikigai for me and i think it's the 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 answer of the question why bitcoin for many of uh, for many of us in this uh, community and in this industry and i think uh, more and more people will find uh, their ikigai uh, in bitcoin and with that i unfortunately need to drop out uh, because i have a call in three minutes but i really appreciate the invitation thank you so much for having me and uh, over to Imo maybe to uh, uh, to keep representing relay in this call thank you guys thank you so much julian yeah, I love the Japanese and the Ikigai is a beautiful, beautiful concept. Definitely Google it and, 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 and work through it. It'll be worth it. Um, uh, Imo, do you, do you have, a, do you have a, a follow up on, on why Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, it would be pretty much in line with what Julian said. It's just, uh, in all honesty, when I was leaving high school, if you had told me that I would be working, let's say in the financial sector, if you want to call this a financial sector, I would have told you that uh, you're bullshitting. Because I had zero interest in anything related to money. Uh, actually, I was always into movies. I worked uh, at movie studios at the start of my career, and then I just randomly sort of landed uh, in the in the Bitcoin industry, um, and then I just fell in love with it. Um, the Ikigai concept is is true for me as well, but I also like this um, sort of this feeling that you are at the start of something um, that's going to be very important in the future. Much like the early days of the internet, you know, I, I really love reading books about startups uh, that are not huge companies and just reading about like the early days of Amazon and Microsoft and all these companies that really built their, their, their success also thanks to the internet. Um, and I feel like if you're in Bitcoin now in, you know, 10, 20 years, people will be looking back at you as well as like, wow, you know, uh, th these are the people who have built this industry. Um, and I think that's quite fascinating. So that's, that's another reason I would say, um, not sure if this is what you wanted to hear. That's fine. Yeah, no, totally. Um, Hector, do you, did you want to take the, take the white Bitcoin question? Yeah, well, it, you know, broken, broken money is the biggest problem in the world. Right. And, and once, once you realize that and you as we all do, we try to figure out what can I do, right? What can I do as an individual to try to help move the solution to this problem forward, uh, whether that's to educate or to build businesses, uh, to help people. Uh, you know, my own background was in education for a long time. I'm sort of a, a teacher at heart and then had some, uh, you know, some experience in the, you know, sales and operations for some different companies. And so it's like, okay, well, I, I think I might be okay at, you know, have some skills in these areas and how can I contribute those skills uh, uh, to Bitcoin uh, to try to advance the cause. And uh, when you feel like you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself, uh, as, uh, you know, Julian mentioned, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very fulfilling. It's funny that he mentioned uh, Iki guy because a, a really good friend of mine, uh, uh, Tracy, is in the audience and uh, she actually bought me that book. 
a handful of years ago and it's been sitting on my shelf and I've never gotten around to reading it. So now I'm, I'm definitely getting that thing off of the shelf so I can read it because uh, uh, it, uh, it, it seems uh, it seems like a, like a terrific book. But uh, so, yeah, it's just it's exciting to be in a space that's growing, in a space that's vibrant, in a space uh, that has so many incredibly talented people contributing to it. Um, and I think we all we, we all really find a lot of fulfillment in, in being able to just be a small part of something that we know can change the world in such a fundamental way. Yeah, the money, the money is at least 50 percent of the problem, um, as Michael Saylor has uh, popularized. Uh, all right. Give me an emoji. Who wants to go next? Why Bitcoin? There we go. We got wiser. Uh, Sanjay, tell, yeah. tell us about it. Um, so I think for why Bitcoin, it's, it's such an interesting question because it's for everyone in the world, but everyone has a different reason of why they get into it, right? Like through, through our app, we found such a wide range of people. Like, are you, are you from a country with a broken currency? Are you from um, you know, Turkey or Zimbabwe, where where you just need to get out of hyperinflation or corruption, or are you are you a girl in India who just doesn't get access to a bank account? Are you are you someone who's working abroad and trying to send um, money back to your family and and can't because of a heavy fee? So I think it really hits hard for different people in different ways, and that's that's actually the beauty of Bitcoin that it's literally for everyone, but just maybe for a different reason. It it, it might even be just for the the really cool tech and and i think the people who initially got into it it's it's that's a, a big reason for why people got into it but for me personally or for a lot of other women that i've spoken to it's it's really the social impact that um that bitcoin has so i think it's just once people are educated and actually understand bitcoin it it actually makes everyone's life better but just in a different way that they don't know about yet Right, so the, the need that people have for actually better money, right? Once you experience that, yeah, yeah, yeah it's so true. Um, yeah, it's very powerful technology. All right, Daniel, uh, tell us why why you Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, as, as she just mentioned, I mean, Bitcoin is something different to everyone. And that is why, I mean, I named our organization Bitcoin is Better. Because that is just a such such a broad, I mean, it, it touches so many things. It's such a broad uh, broad idea. Um, for me personally, I I lean into uh, theft is wrong. So regardless of your 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 culture, your your religious background, I mean, anywhere you go in this world, theft is wrong. And personally, I don't I don't want my three young children to grow up in a world where they're stolen from or in order to succeed, they feel like they have to steal from others uh, through money printing. Uh, so that, that really motivates me uh, to get behind the mission and, uh, and figure out what that means. Bitcoin is better uh, to, to different people and, and basically try to formulate questions to get them thinking about money uh, that I would want to be asked before I, before I came to understand Bitcoin. Uh, so, so yeah, theft is wrong is mine, but, but like she mentioned, Bitcoin is better means something different to everyone. Theft is definitely wrong. Um, Nico, do you want to take a, take a shot of the question? Why sure, uh, the question is why Bitcoin, right? Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, Bitcoin is different things to different people. Um, I think most people would be lying if they said they didn't come for the money but i could tell you that most people stay for the revolution right and that is really what we're living through right now um which is the separation of money and state right um i think the internet started the fire um uh, it allowed people to uh communicate directly with each other without going through uh, an intermediary, a middleman, a gatekeeper, so to speak, like we all, we're all doing right now on spaces. And that's really awoken people. And that's really gotten people to start to ask questions, right? Um, you know, one of the one of the things that was mentioned yesterday in one of the Contillionaire Conference speeches, or, or the better said, the World Economic, Spe World Economic Forum speeches, was, uh, you know, they were complaining about misinformation. Well, it's like, yeah, of course, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd be pissed off uh, with people, you know, calling out the scam of fiat, the scam of inflation. 
Um, so I think, you know, Bitcoin is the next step. The, it's the next step. It's the next step for individuals taking back sovereignty. Um, I think it's the evolution, uh, human evolution taking place. I think it's going to fundamentally change the relationship between the individual and the state. Um, I really believe in the theory from the sovereign individual. I really believe that's going to play out. But I think as Bitcoiners, we have to take agency. We have to take action. We really have to take it upon ourselves to wake up the masses, to really like kind of shake them up and say, hey, guys, you know, you're blaming the other political you know, side for a lot of your economic woes and hardships. But in reality, you know, regardless of what political parties in power, you know, they're just printing a ton of money. And if you're, you know, if you don't own assets, meaning if you're in the lower and middle classes, uh, you're getting poorer every time they print money, you know, you don't benefit from asset inflation. So yeah, why Bitcoin? I mean, uh, I, what type of future do I want my children to be living in? Do I want my children to be living in a future of nihilism, of slavery, of tyranny? Because that's the future that they want for us with these central bank digital currencies, with this censorship, right? And that, that's the future that they, that they openly advocate for. I mean, their own propaganda is telling you you'll own nothing and be happy, right? Um, well, you know, what I got to say about that is no. I'm going to own Bitcoin. I'm going to be happy. And I'm going to fight until that happens. And this is a different type of warfare. This is fifth generational warfare. It's really about winning over the hearts and minds in the battleground of the Internet. This is narrative trench warfare every single day. Our memes are better than ours, better than theirs. And uh, we just got to wake up enough people to the truth, to, to, to the truth that fiat money is a scam, that money doesn't have to lose purchasing power to work. Um, and I think the world will be a much, much better place for it. So, yeah, that's why Bitcoin, I came for the money. And then I realized, like, no, there's there's a much bigger uh, thing happening here. And uh, Bitcoin gave me purpose. And, uh, you know, every single day I try to give something back to it for that. Um, um Came for the money, stay for the beat for the meme war. And that's, by the way, uh, some of us, some of us have seen this movie before, right? You know, you know, you know, you know, Nico comes, you know, comes from, you know, from a place outside of the U.S. where he's seen the impact of broken money when it gets to, you know, to more advanced states. You know, my own family's from Cuba and uh, had to give everything up in order to come over here and give me a chance so that I might have a better life. Well, the problem is, is that now uh, every government everywhere is running that playbook is running the playbook of squeezing and stealing everything that they possibly can as much of the time and energy and future from every single person on earth. And so, uh, you know, as uh, Hillel said, you know, if, if, if we are for ourselves alone, you know, then who are we? And if not now, when? So if we're, if, if change is going to happen, it has to come from us. So, and uh, it's, it's exciting to be a part of something that, you know, is going to be really important, uh, you know, in, in the future. Yeah, some of us have seen the future of this this fiat collapse, and it's it's not pretty, you know. Um, like, uh, just real quick, uh, my mom used to buy a bag of milk for like what today wouldn't buy me a candy, you know. And and that was like that was only you know a couple of decades ago or three decades ago, right? So um, it's just ridiculous to see how how people's energy and, and savings can get decimated over such short periods of time and then people are wondering why they're broke and why life is tough and why you know it's so hard to like advance it's like yeah it's because your money sucks you know so we, we got to fix the money to to fix a big part of the world uh also the sovereign individual great book if you guys haven't heard about it uh kind of one of those cornerstones of bitcoin culture uh, i don't agree with everything on it but it's 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 definitely a must read uh mr johnson why do you bitcoin hey great space man yeah, it's it's amazing because, you know, Bitcoin is money and technology and that conversation will take you anywhere. So everyone's coming in from these amazing backgrounds. You have no idea who you're talking to, but like everyone's, you know, people are really good at understanding patterns. And I think a lot of us see the pattern that we're on and are looking for something unique. So to be a part of something like truly novel that we are beyond blueprints is just amazing like every day you have no idea what conversation you're gonna get into yeah i love that i love how like the, the the quality of the conversations that i've had in this industry just constantly fascinating it's it's so 
so many topics that are so profound that I think that's definitely what keeps me going in many ways. It's just, just I love having you know deep conversations and great conversations. Um, there's uh, there's other reasons, but uh, I'll give the floor to to John from Premier Bitcoin. Uh, you know, you guys are are doing something very special and very unique. I think you guys are. Oh, you know, breaking ground um, where where it hasn't really been broken at that scale before. So why why do you Bitcoin, Mr. John? Yeah, thanks. Um, so like a lot of people said, the the money is broken, right? And I 100% agree with that. But I, I think it's actually pretty profound the effects that that has on society. And I actually think that it's I would like to replace that the money is broken with the incentive system is broken, the, the power structure is broken, the world is broken, right? And, and I think I don't see Bitcoin as an end to a better world. I see it as a means to it, right? Like, I, I don't actually care about Bitcoin. I care about what Bitcoin incentivizes. And the world is broken, in my opinion, because we don't control our own lives in our present and we don't control our own future. Somebody else makes the rules and they could change it at any time. So knowing that the rules could change in a day, a week, a year, a decade, that disincentivizes us to, to, to build, to plan, um, to look forward to the future. And Bitcoin flips that, right? Bitcoin gives us power over our money in our present and because it's, we know what the rules are and we know that there's not just like six guys in a room that could change it. Um, it encourages us to, to look into the future. I mean, it's also, we think that it's going to be worth more in the future, right? So it's like also the world that we live in is all of your, you know, we're incentivized to spend where Bitcoin, we're incentivized to think further into the future because the value is going up, but also more than that, because we have control. Right. And like that is so empowering and so liberating in ways that I think are mostly subconscious, that it's like I am in control of my own destiny. That's I think that's really what Bitcoin gives us. And that changes everything. It changes like the mental models that we have and, and how we think about the world. So, yeah, that's that's why that's why I Bitcoin and at Mute Premier Bitcoin, we're always trying to push, push frontiers, right? So, um, you know, we're trying to lean into that, lean into that future because I, I, I think Hector said something like, if not us, then who, right? I, I, again, Bitcoin gives us permission, not, not permission, we don't need permission. Bitcoin enhances our ability to influence our own lives and therefore influence the world around us. But only if we take advantage of it, right? And like all the people on this call, all the people in Bitcoin, like they are, right? They're, they're, they're using this to, to try to have an impact, right? To try to move things in a better direction. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's why I Bitcoin, because I, I think that the world is broken and in order to fix it, we need to radically change the sense of structure and Bitcoin is the best means to that end. Yeah. Yeah. Bitcoin definitely changes some stuff within us, right? I'm working with, I'm talking to some psychologists that want to do, uh, want to do some financial literacy programs and education. And, you know, the, the question of how Bitcoin changes you, I think is still open. I think it's still very interesting, you know, um, just the long-term thinking that it, that it incentivizes, I think has, pretty deep, deep consequences, you know? And so this is one of the reasons that I Bitcoin, I, I love, I love that dimension of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think the quality of the people that it, that it attracts as well. I, 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 you know, I love to see this, this kind of combination between, you know, being on a mission to make the world better and also, you know, having new technology and also having better money. Right. I mean, m money is kind of like this, this sort of, superpower if you know if you know how to manage it and how to play with it 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 really expands your abilities you know so um i think i i love the i love teaching people about money i think money is very 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 interesting thing that unfortunately you know as as we were talking about earlier it's just 
very poorly uh, communicated throughout the world. Most people are completely ignorant of it. It's just like water that they're swimming in and they're wondering why, you know, why they're drowning, right? And um, so, yeah. Um, did I did I miss anybody? Uh, has everybody kind of tackled the question? I think so, right? All right. So let's let's. Um, I kind of want to jump into this 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 question of of messaging and advertising again because I think I think it's sort of a very clear challenge that that we have in part because we don't have. You know, the access to advertising uh, rails is somewhat limited. Um, but then there's also like all these questions about about messaging and how to present Bitcoin to people and how to actually, um, you know, how to how to invite them in. Right. Um, why? Uh, Sanjay, you, you were you were talking a little bit about how you guys grew organically uh, and been growing organically very well. Um, is there anything else that you can tell us about uh, your, your, your thinking around messaging or you know, like, what is it, you know, what's the, do you start, do you lead with the money, right? Like, Hey, this is better money. Or like, how do you, how are you guys positioning yourself to the public? Yeah. So I think definitely, like you said, the, the messaging is key. It's about having the right words and making sure that you're not going to be banned or restricted on any any kind of platform, right? And of course, Facebook, Instagram, they're all really strict um, with the stuff. But uh, but like I said, because we're more education, we, we, we kind of found loopholes and don't, we make sure we stay away from words like, um, you know, invest in this asset, grow your money, cryptocurrency, like we stay away from those words and we make sure it's more about um, just financial literacy, education, empowerment, uh, so it, it, it is a lot of experiment. It's not like we, we didn't get banned a few times or, you know, we had to, we had to redo a lot of our ads, but I think again, it, it's about personalization and finding the right people. Like if you're, um, like the only reason we grew organically is because people, people say that, okay, we're, uh, the best way to actually learn about better money or how to fix the world. So I think, it's it's just getting those keywords in. Um, I know that's harder for a lot of other businesses because we can see ourselves as financial literacy and Bitcoin. But for a Bitcoin only business, I can imagine being imagine that being a little bit harder. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would see that as Bitcoin grows, it would only get a little easier, or you know, these platforms would be more lenient uh, towards advertising this. But it's it. it like you said, it's just about finding a loophole and finding a way around it, and um, and growing organically is the best way, right? If you can if you can get people to recommend your business, that's that's the most that's actually the best way to grow. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Emo uh, Julian was the one that brought up this this question of of marketing. How are you guys specifically kind of trying to let's say message, and who are you trying to reach? How do you think about this problem? Uh, well, I mean that's that, that's a that's a big question that I could talk about this for for, for a long time. But I would say um, I agree with what's been said already. It's really important um, that also you understand the community. I believe um, that, that that's probably one of the key key components of successfully growing because uh, we already mentioned and it's been already discussed that obviously you don't have access to all the advertising you would have outside of Bitcoin if you're you know a traditional company. Um, so it's very important that you actually understand the audience, uh, you understand the community, you, you sort of speak their language. Um, in terms of uh, how to market Bitcoin itself, I think, I believe that uh, one company alone can't really do it. I think this is a, this is a collective effort. Uh, you can't just go to somebody who's not prepared um, to hear about Bitcoin and be like, hey, buy Bitcoin from us. Um, I think there's, there's lots of steps of education. So we specifically target people who are already sort of somehow on the on the on the borders of getting into the industry. Um, this is actually very often shitcoiners, people who are into crypto. Um, I think most people's journey into Bitcoin is actually through shitcoins. You know, they get burned and then they learn and then they become Bitcoiners. So these people are essentially uh, the best target audience outside of uh, Bitcoiners to 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 go and reach out to them. And then as a company of how to do, you know, marketing, um, 
Bitcoin companies especially tend to be <clears throat> smaller with smaller with smaller resources um, but you are competing against a lot of noise out there so I think what's most important is that you actually have have a voice you you work on your brand and you you try to separate yourself uh, through through just proper branding <clears throat> you know not treating your your company as a company but treat it as a person who is this person um and then people really reacted positively we have we have basically i think figured this out quite well um we have grown a lot organically we don't actually spend that much money on on paid marketing at all um so most of the growth we had so far um is because of, of just you know doing doing uh, marketing well and trying to work with the community the other thing that works really really well and i think Liza would be able to talk about this a lot more is just provide value um, and mainly through education, um, and I consider memes, by the way, being 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 also valuable and and education as well. It's just basically the the, the new version of of providing valuable content. Uh, I think it's very important that whenever you post something online, that it's either has an educational um, sort of value or or it's funny. And memes are actually sort of uh, sort of rich in a, in a bang middle of this because they they tend to be funny. But there's also a deeper message always. Um, so, you know, you, you need to speak the voice of the audience and you need to do good memes is how I would sum this up uh, <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, we got we to gotta dominate the memes of production, uh, people, you know? You got to be... Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and with that, sorry, I will have to jump as well. Thank you very much for the invite, guys. Uh, have a good discussion and happy to join next time as well. Thank you, Ivo. See you. Uh, see you later. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, this question about messaging is super, super interesting. And well, anyway, anyway who, who else wants to take uh, take a shot at this question? You know, how do we how do we communicate? And it's too bad Nico left because Nico was actually ha he had some good points about breaking out of the Bitcoin bubble. Um, I definitely think that the memes are are very important. Um, you know, and it would be great to get like some of our meme people are really good. Like I, I love what yellow is doing, you know, it's just like, you know, modern day internet, uh, stand up comedy. Right. So yellow, we've had him on the show before he's around, um, uh, actor, do you guys have, oh wait, Daniel, well, Daniel was raising his hand. So maybe let's go with Daniel. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're writing a book. How do you, how do you think about messaging? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I loved what, uh, what he shared about. You know, if you're going to post something online, let it be educational or funny um, and give value first. Um, I, I think the approach that I'm really doubling down on is asking questions, uh, especially to break through the censorship walls. I mean, because if it becomes illegal to ask a question, I think I think that's going to going to wake a lot of people up um, to to the degree of, you know, censorship tyranny that we're living under. So asking simple questions like, why are prices going up? How many dollars exist? How are dollars created? And then just a little tagline, study why Bitcoin is better. Um, will they study why Bitcoin is better on the first question? Probably not. It's going to take multiple unanswered questions. Uh, but I think creating that open loop uh, will, will create a desire for, for Bitcoin education. And... And I agree. I mean, most people come to this Bitcoin only Bitcoin maximalist position after, you know, getting rug pulled in crypto. Um, so I think it'd be really cool if we can almost give people a, a scholarship <laughs> to Bitcoin only where you don't have to pay your crypto dues. Uh, so if we can frame questions where people see crypto as completely different from Bitcoin, uh, I think I think that that could be a huge value add in our marketing, and and like I said, one of the reasons that uh, that I founded this nonprofit is I feel like a nonprofit focused on financial education. Uh, for one, it drops people's guards. So when I when I've spoken to people in public about Bitcoin, uh, as soon as I mention that we're working on a nonprofit focused on financial education, the guard drops uh, because whether we like it or not. I mean, Bitcoin is associated with crypto to to the public. Uh, so 
the minute that people are like, hey, this, this guy is not trying to sell me anything. Um, he's trying to educate. I think, I think that that's going to be a different way of doing it um, this cycle than we've done in the past. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's, that's my two sats. Uh, and I'm going to have to jump off to, I, I've got to travel. I'm going to be down at uh, Bitcoin day in Naples, Florida. So anyone that's there, be sure to, to hit me up. We'll have a table. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel. That's a, that's a great insight. Uh, opening up with questions, you know, the que- the question, asking a good question is a skill actually that is uh, very kind of forgotten, you know? Um, a good a good portion of our of our civilization stands on on you know the, Socrates asking the right questions to to people in the marketplace, right? And I think maybe that's uh, that's part of the skills that we gotta gotta bring out. That's that's a super super cool insight. Um, wow! All right, uh, Hector, do you have some uh, some thoughts on this question and messaging? I, I think the, everyone's touched on some really excellent points. I, I mean, you know, back to Uh, you know, really, really good author in kind of the business space. Uh, You know, Stephen Covey wrote a book a long time ago, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of those is, uh, uh, you know, seek first to understand and then to be understood, right? So uh, whether it's using questions the way that Daniel describes, which is a terrific way, is first thinking about who is it that you're speaking to and what is the challenge that they're facing? So if if you know a little bit about the person, uh, you know, engaging them with questions that are going to lead to a discussion around a problem that you know that they already have. Or if it's a broader marketing strategy, uh, you know, understanding the general audience that you're speaking to and the kinds of problems that as a group they are most likely to have and engaging them about the problem, right? Nobody cares about your solution until, the, until they know that you understand their problem and that you feel their pain. So if you start with what you know is an existing challenge, whether that's your mom or a marketing campaign, uh, you're likely to have a much more productive conversation that opens up the possibility for them to be willing to listen to your solution. So uh, I think when you start with that approach, um, whether it's at an individual or at a group level, you're going to tend to be more effective in your communication and in your success rate. So uh, uh, that's, you know, an, an idea that we hope to carry through, uh, you know, at Rhino that I know that Daniel and, and, uh, and Julian and all these other teams and, and Nico are also doing every single day with, with their audiences. Um, so that's, you know, an idea to consider. Yeah. And the, the idea of, of marketing, you know, like I think recognizing the reality of the market in terms of, you know, a lot of these crypto scams and crypto projects, they actually do a lot of marketing and they're very, um, they're very successful in marketing. I think in some ways they've been better than, than Bitcoiners in marketing, partly because they have no real, you know, there's nothing holding them back. They'll just go, they'll, they'll say anything. Right. And then, and then they, that brings people in and then some of those people make money and some of those people get scammed. And then going after them as Relay was, was the, the Relay guys were saying like, you know, uh, uh, following up, you know, going for the people that have maybe lost money in, in, in crypto and saying, hey, we have the real stuff over here. We have the, the secure, long lasting, you know, money over here. Uh, why don't you come over here instead? Right. I think that's that's a really interesting strategy. Right. Uh, you know, kind of leveraging leveraging the, the general market. Right. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thought. I mean, so far this is fantastic for any any marketer or or mess you know messaging uh, any company that's trying to you know customer acquisition, which is pretty much every company, right? Like well, without customer acquisition, you don't have a company. So um, that's huge. Um, anybody else want to take a shot at that question? I think John hasn't spoken. Maybe Johnson, you have you have something to add? Uh, yeah. So I would just add. I mean, I agree with with what everyone's already said, um, especially that it's contextual, right? Like each person's a little bit different. Um, Asking questions is always really great because, you know, it allows people to to kind of make their own narrative. Uh, The only thing that I would add is is something that, that resonates with me is show, don't tell, right? So whenever possible, um, you know, like it's great to explain theory uh, of Bitcoin to someone, 
but in my experience, it's even better to show them, right? So like here in El Salvador, when we have a, a meetup, um, and we, you know, we send some, some, some sats to, to people that come and they send it to somebody else, like they actually use it. Uh, and this is their first time, right? We're targeting people who are brand new. It, it's really cool to explain that this is permissionless, that you could send this anywhere. But uh, I found that when you show people, be like, hey, you just downloaded this app. It took a minute. You didn't have to give any identifying information. Uh, and then you just sent it the same way that you sent it to, to me. You could send it to your cousin in Venezuela or Nicaragua, which you can't easily send value to otherwise. Um, and you don't need to ask permission for that. That, that It's really powerful to, to combine the two, I guess, right? To, to, to explain what's happening, but to show them, right? To actually show whenever possible that that has a, a big impact on people. Yeah, I love I love the reaction people have when you send them sats, even if it's something like using uh, Wallet of Satoshi or uh, these days Aqua is actually kind of a, a wallet I'm starting to recommend. Um, the experience of receiving sats instantly without having to like you know uh, tell somebody your blood type and uh, you know a picture of your kidney, right? Uh, that's that's great. <laughs> that's very very powerful. Um, great point. Yeah. John, you guys, how do you guys think about messaging? Yeah, so I, I think the same show don't tell uh, applies there, right? Like we, uh, announcements are, are, are great and they actually probably get more, more attention because um, that's still the world that we're coming from. But the we, we try to show rather than tell whenever possible. So we often wait to to make an announcement. We don't actually make an announcement that we're going to do something. We we tell people what we've already done. Like this is what we this is from a class that we had this morning or graduation yesterday or or this is how many students we taught last month or um to show the work rather than to tell what you will be doing. And that I, I think that acts as a sort of filter, right? It doesn't reach as many people, but the people that it does reach, it it connects with them at a deeper level. Uh, so it's really like a quantity versus quality, and, and you know, there's probably a time and place for both, right? Um, but yeah, that that has been our as much as possible. We try to learn from Bitcoin itself, and and uh, proof of work, right? So. You know, I, I want to live in, and, and as an organization, we hope to move the world in this direction towards where proof of work matters more than anything else. Yeah, I was going to say that, proof of work. Um, what, a, what a powerful meme. There's also this idea in the, cyber, in the cypherpunk uh, world of, you know, cypherpunks write code. They don't, they don't talk about it. They, they right. write it. Right. And I think that's, a, that's a very similar idea, you know, like proof of work, just get it done and let the work sell for you rather than like, you know, um, talk about what you want to do, but not doing it. Right. So that's, yeah, that's, that's very powerful. Um, let's talk about talent acquisition, right? So like that, this is another piece that's important, right? Like having a good team, getting the right people to join you. Um, you know, especially for business, um, you know, getting good talent is always difficult, right? And there's a lot of good talent out there, but there's a lot of competitors, right? Especially in the fiat world. Um, how do you guys think about that? How do you guys look or filter through, through people that want to maybe join your organization or, or help you build this, this vision that you have? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Feel free to raise your hand. Give me an emoji. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Johnson, I think you have the mic on. Maybe you want to take it on. There we go, Hector. Let's let's talk about talent. Yeah. So so being you know being a, a very new startup, you know we're sort of just at the beginning of that journey. We've had uh, you know we've had a great development and tech team that's helped us build the app over this last uh, you know uh, you know couple of years. 
but now as we start to build out other parts of the organization, uh, one approach that we've taken is we are talking to other Bitcoiners, <laughs> uh, both informally and formally, right? Who has the proof of work uh, that shows that they are they have the skills and the, the, the motivation and they're going to be the right kind of fit for our culture. Um, one thing that, that we did was, was work uh, with a Bitcoin talent company, uh, you know, which is a, a group of Bitcoiners that, uh, you know, are also professional, you know, recruiters and really understand what it means to be a Bitcoin company and what it means to be Bitcoiners uh, and working with them to identify, you know, some talented folks for, for some leadership roles that we are, are sourcing. So between our own networks and our own experiences and the, the Bitcoiners who we know are talented in the space and then leveraging some of the expertise of people who are professionals in, uh, in identifying and connecting companies with talent um, that's been our, that's been our approach is to see what people do and, uh, and then figure out how they might be able to, to help us, uh, help us meet our goals in a way that also helps them achieve their personal goals and professional goals. Hmm. Yeah. How much do you care about, um, degrees and certifications and uh, so well, on? Well, you know, I mean, in, in, in certain roles, you know, that kind of a thing, you know, might be important. For example, if you're looking for somebody in legal and compliance, uh, you probably want to make sure that that person has the right, uh, you know, kinds of training and certification. But uh, outside of roles that are not specifically requiring of some kind of a credential in order to identify them as being um, qualified to to speak about a particular you know issue, uh, personally, I could care less. Uh, I'm much more interested in what is that person's proof of work. Uh, what have they demonstrated in terms of their ability to execute on the kinds of skills. Uh, uh, and have the kind of skills and execute in the kinds of projects that we need them for. Uh, and also, what is that person's motivation? And what is their particular why for wanting to be a part of, uh, whether it's our company or, or any group that I'm affiliated with? Uh, that to me is much, much more important uh, because most of the things that a person needs to learn in a particular organization are usually taught to you by that organization. Um, it's the things that can't be taught that are more important. Right. Yeah, showing the proof of work, getting the why, and uh, probably being open to learning as well, right? Because, yeah, you're right. Like, mo most of the education today, right, like, it's it's pretty questionable, you know. It seems like businesses are the ones doing the education uh, these yeah, days. There's, there's, plenty, there's plenty of excellent education out there. I mean, you know, and I have been an sure. educator at, you know, in, in formal environments at various points in my life. So, uh, uh, that said, you know, having hired you know, folks over the course of many years, uh, uh, it, it's not always the person who has, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the pristine credentials who ultimately is able to be the most successful. Uh, there tend to be other factors that, uh, that determine success that don't necessarily, uh, don't necessarily show up just on somebody's resume. So, uh, getting to know the individual, understanding what motivates them, understanding how they're going to deal with adversity, with challenges, with bad days, uh, understanding that they have some kind of a North star that is going to help them get through those difficult times. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, that I think, uh, uh, helps identify somebody who really can be successful in your organization for the long term. Right. Um, John, how do you guys think about talent acquisition, so to speak? I mean, you guys have a very different organizational structure so you know what are you guys looking for um as you grow this um uh, bitcoin yeah so on the on the debate of mercenaries versus missionaries um i think we already leaned pretty heavily to one side of this and our experience just has pushed us even further towards towards missionaries right like we want missionaries because uh, this isn't because we're trying to do something that is new and different. That means that there's a lot of unexpected obstacles and challenges. And it's, it's frankly not like, <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of money and there's a lot of challenges, which kind of is its own filter, right? Cause that the only people who are attracted to that are, are attracted to, to it because they they see a greater purpose in it um and those are the people that when the challenges come are are best able to handle them because they actually care about it right so so we 
Yeah, we, we seek missionaries. We seek people that, that want to change the world. And uh, again, it's, it's kind of like putting out that billboard that this is what we're doing. This is who we are. And it's pretty, it's pretty passive. So we, um, we have in the past advertised positions, but for the most part, people approach us and actually an example of, uh, which I'd love if this continued, but there is someone who is, he helped us organize an event in November and now he's helping us organize an event next month in February. And he said, like, this is my job application, right? I, I want to show you what I'm capable of, what my skill set is. And then you guys can decide whether there's, there's a spot for me. Um, and he did that all on his own, which I, I would love to encourage that as a way for people to apply for jobs in the Bitcoin space is, is don't show me your resume, show me what you could actually do. Um, so yeah, we, I, I think that so long as we continue to stay true to our mission, then there's, I don't see an issue with attracting talent, but they're going to be mission oriented people, um, which again is what we're looking for. Yeah, yeah, proof of work and mission orientation. Yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, no, that's that's definitely the way to go. I mean, we live in a proof of work culture in this industry, which is great. That's uh, that's one of my favorite things about it. Um, all right, the, the last the last topic that I think we should definitely hit on and 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 talk a little bit about is obviously raising capital. Um, you know, raising raising capital is a very important piece of growing a business. Uh, you know, many businesses or startups are kind of like self-funded, at least in this space, I've seen that a lot, but that at some point you gotta, you gotta raise some capital to grow. Um, maybe, uh, we can start with, uh, Rhino, uh, maybe actor John, so you guys want to tell us a little bit about, you know, the experiences you guys have had raising capital in the Bitcoin space for a Bitcoin company, uh, how you've managed that. And then uh, we can come back to come back to John. Well, for us, I'm really interested to hear, uh, uh, you know, John share some of his journey, uh, being a little bit familiar with it. Um, but as far as right, I mean, you know, we're again, we're, we're pretty early in that process. So, you know, we we are, uh, you know, self-funded at this point. Uh, there was a, you know, sort of a small, um, you know, kind of friends and family, you know, round, you know, pre-seed round, if you will, that our CEO and founder, uh, you know, facilitated. He has a tremendous amount of experience in capital markets uh, uh, over the course of you know several decades. So we benefited, I think, uh, from his experience and expertise in that area. Certainly, that's uh, that's an area that that we're going to be looking to uh, we're going to be looking to tap markets as we uh, continue to grow and expand and show our proof of work that we've got a uh, you know a viable product that's attracting customers. Uh, we think uh, timing wise, we're heading into probably a pretty positive environment. For, uh, for funding in the space, because uh, as we move through this part of the Bitcoin cycle over the next couple of years, um, we anticipate that that will bring more capital into the space. But uh, for now, what we're really focused on is just executing on our strategy, delivering a good product and a good experience to our customers so that, uh, you know, then through their actions, they demonstrate that we've got a good business and we've got a good model. And uh, we expect that that will attract interest from, uh, from investors as we continue to try to grow. Oh, there we go. Yep. No, that's, 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 that's really interesting. Um, the whole startup world is, is, uh, is, uh, it's, it's, it's like a niche on its own, you know, and we've had Moss on the show before and had a, we had a really good couple of episodes with Moss and, uh, some of his contacts, uh, from, uh, from, from, uh, lighting ventures. Right. So we've, we've had some shows on that. If you're interested, you can look back to the catalog. We're, we're on Spotify by the way, and uploading actively. So I think we have, Probably the Moss episode is already there. If you guys want to check it out, just look up the Huang Gao show and you'll be able to find it. Um, John, um, you, as a nonprofit, how are you guys uh, navigating this fundraising side of things? Um, you know, you got you to pay the bills somehow, right? So, uh, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, so this says uh, the answer to this would be different depending on like the month that you ask in, right? Or more and more like the year that you ask in. It's not that fast. Um, so in the beginning, in 2021, you know, early 2022, then 
our expenses were pretty low. We were all volunteer. We didn't have a ton of classes. Um, so it was a mix of, there was some self-financing to, to get started and some, you know, donations from, from friends. Um, we then moved like that. And that's always been, you know, donations from individuals has, has been kind of the only constant, uh, but then there was a, we kind of moved to, because we wanted to do more work um, and we started to attract attention from some sponsors. So we had sponsors uh, and we still do. Um, but what we're moving towards now is, and I think this is the future of the project, in complemented with individual donors, which are so important, right? It's like, it's... Uh, like we want to have the support of the community and this is again like it's cool if they like a tweet but this is kind of a deeper way to to say that you support what we're doing and so it, it's really encouraging for everyone on the team to see, to see to see that come in but what we are moving towards is more grants so we got um just a few weeks ago we announced that we got our first grant from the human rights foundation uh, and literally just yesterday, we announced that we got a discovery grant from Block. And that is something, both of those were, you know, the announcements were, were recent, but they took some time to get to that point. And we have, as we've grown, we've tried to professionalize quite a bit, which is very helpful for these grants. Um, they, they need a lot of data from us. Uh, probably actually more than sponsors. Sponsors are tend to be a bit more self-interested, like, you know, how is this going to help my business work grants tend to be more, a bit more like, how are you helping the whole space, um, which is more our MO, and, and grants tend to want, <laughs> want to try to change you less than sponsors, which is kind of a constant battle with sponsors to try to maintain our independence. Um, so now that we have this infrastructure set up for grants, we actually have a, like a professional grant writer on staff who worked with us uh, salary for a little bit and just he, a sponsor was actually paying his salary. Um, really liked what he saw. We orange built him in the process. He was not previously a Bitcoiner. And now he's, he's just uh, effectively a volunteer, right? He's an advisor. He works for free for us. Um, but he's in the space so he could reach into, it's not just Bitcoin grants, right? There's like grants about education, about human rights, about empowerment, about like so many other things. And I think this is a, yeah, so I'm, I'm optimistic that we could increase our funding and decrease the, the potential for, for mission creep. Uh, which is always a danger. Wherever you're getting your money from, like that's always a danger that the money influences what you do, right? So it's like if we could minimize that and increase our budget, then that's that's really the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talk a lot about financial education as as um, a very important piece in the education side of things, uh, but it's also like a brand that's very large. You know, like there's. A lot of books that have been written. I have a, a blog on my, uh, an article on my blog at Wangal.com where I, you know, I recommend like 13 books that I think are fantastic on financial literacy. Um, so there's a whole industry on financial literacy. Um, how do you guys, do you guys think about your messaging or your education? Like, does the education program touch on financial literacy concepts as a kind of, you know, groundwork for Bitcoin education? Or how do you guys navigate those challenges? Because, you know, if you don't understand what money is, you how do you get yeah. Bitcoin, right? A hundred percent. So the, the flagship product, which is the Bitcoin Diploma, it's a 10-week program. The first four weeks don't mention the word Bitcoin. So the first, the first, almost the first half of the course is about financial literacy. In fact, the, the subtitle of the book is, you know, it's the Bitcoin Diploma and the subtitle is financial education in the Bitcoin era. So yeah, we, it's important before you tell someone what the solution is, they need to understand what the problem is, right? So financial literacy and that base understanding is so important, right? Like you, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody falls in love with Bitcoin without falling out of love with fiat first, right? Um, 
so yeah, totally agree that that that's the foundation. Yeah, that's a good point. If they love fiat, Bitcoin is just going to be kind of weird, right? So they have to uh, <laughs> have to see the cracks in it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then so so that's great. So you're you're fundraising through through um through a variety of means. Um, yeah. Is and I think that's they, yeah. Too. Well, have to basically, like, there's redundancy. So if you lose, if donors, there's a, the price goes down, so donors are less generous, individual donors, or, or you know, sponsors, for whatever reason, drop off, or, you know, the grant application doesn't go through. Like, I think having a diversity of, having redundancy creates resiliency, right? So that's kind of how we look at it. Like, we actually don't want to have a small number of, funding avenues we want to the the more the better right the the stronger we are um right right and th does the the whole etf thing right i think it was van Eck that was saying that they were going to donate like five percent of their of their revenue or profits to um to well bitcoin development or you know bitcoin infrastructure um do you believe that is there is that a new source of potential grants and and funding for uh for me, primarily because it's a nonprofit. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, as I understand it, I think there's two of the ETF providers that that have pledged some percent of their profits. Um, so, it wouldn't go to it would go to people that distribute it. So, I, I think like OpenSats and Human Rights Foundation and Brinks. I think there were like three organizations that are going to be the beneficiaries of that. Who's it's not their whole job, right? They do lots of other things, but they already have a pretty good infrastructure for giving away money, essentially giving away grants. So I think it. I think the the end result is it's going to increase the budgets of of um, you know those particular organizations. So maybe the grants that we get could be slightly slightly larger, right? They might increase like the grant amounts because they have more more funding to work with, and I think that's a great. Like, I hope there's more of that in, in the space, that there's more companies, especially, you know, companies that are making significant profits, like these ETFs might, um, but like exchanges, whatever, that, that don't select where they give their money to, but give it to like an overreaching um, fund that, that gives out grants. And that, that mitigates a lot of the risk of, of like mission creep, right? That mitigates a lot of the risk of, of like sponsors trying to buy influence. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I love it. I think, 